Okay, good morning and welcome to everyone. Um, um, well, let me briefly introduce myself for those who do not know me. I'm Stefano Duga, I'm, I'm the head of the Department of Biomedical Sciences of Humanitas University. And in this position, I'm here to present the today's seminar that will be held by Professor Luigi Solbiati. Uh, indeed, this is just the first one of a series of seminars that uh, we decided to organize for uh, incoming uh, professors in the Humanitas University, and so that they could present themselves to the faculty and to the entire hospital. Uh, and as you know very well, Humanitas University is pretty young. We started just 15 months ago. So recruitment has been quite active in the past few months. And uh, beside Professor Solbiati, on the 1st of July, we also enrolled Professor Armando Santoro. And one month later, we enrolled also other two professors, Professor Repici and Professor Efrem Civilini. And on the 1st of October, we will have six additional members in the academia, so we have at least nine of those seminars coming in the next few months, so a pretty uh, busy schedule. Um, let me spend just a couple of words to present our speaker. I'm really honored to present you Professor Luigi Solbiati. Uh, Gigi graduated in medicine and surgery at the University of Milan and also did his residency in radiology at the same university. Then he spent some period abroad, particularly at the Royal Marsden Hospital in Sutton, UK, at the Department of Physics in the Bristol Hospital, and at the Department of Radiology at the University of California, San Diego. His main fields of interest concern interventional procedures in oncologic diseases, particularly image-guided thermal ablation. And indeed, he was one of the pioneers in this field. He has one of the largest experience in the world in the treatment of liver malignancies with radiofrequency ablation and more recently also with high power microwaves. His research activity has been focused on the continuous search for technological advancements of the imaging methods for the guidance of thermal ablation and particularly the systems of navigation through real time fusion of ultrasound and CT, MRI and more recently PET scans. His track of publication is really impressive. He has published more than 110 full papers that have been cited more than 10,000 times uh, with an H index of 41. And this lecture today will highlight the incredibly rapid change, both from the technological and from the clinical point of view, of thermal ablation therapies with an overview on the main field of application and to the future development of these technologies, with the hope that Humanitas will have a leading role in the future advancement in this field. So I will finish here and allow Professor Solbiati to take the floor to give his lecture, and the title, you can read it, is The Evolutionary Transformation of Imaging and Ablative Therapies into the Discipline of Interventional Oncology. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Stefano, for this kind introduction. I'm very glad to open this series of uh, seminars dedicated to the new professors of the Humanities University. I'm very also glad and proud to be involved in this new, uh, very active uh, uh, university. Uh, the title of, uh, of my lecture is a wide title. Of course, I will focus on some specific uh, fields uh, in order to limit the time of my presentation. Uh, let me just uh, start with the, sorry, okay, with the summary of my lecture. First of all, let me define what is now considered the image-guided intervention oncology. These terms includes every cancer therapy done by ablation and catheter-based techniques guided by any imaging modality. I will briefly uh, describe some historical notes, uh, then some current uh, clinical results, uh, uh, advancements, which is the most important part of my presentation, and some uh, final thoughts with some predictions regarding the future. Let me start with some uh, history. 
Uh, probably the young people here in the room do not know that the history of image-guided intervention started more than 40 uh, years ago with fine needle aspiration biopsy, and subsequently the uh, angiographic procedures, uh, the cholangiographic procedures started, uh, and uh, in the 80s also the chemoembolization uh, started. In 1985, uh, in uh, our group, we, we published this uh, paper uh, the treatment with ethanol of parathyroid tumors in uremic patients. And historically, this can be considered the first paper ever published regarding the treatment, the percutaneous treatment of a solid tumor, even if benign tumors in this case, uh, under the guidance of imaging. And just one year later, my great friend Tito Livraghi published this first paper in the world literature regarding the treatment with the same modality, ethanol, of uh, apotoserval carcinomas. These two papers probably were the, the starting points of this uh, uh, new uh, medical uh, field. 1987, cryo was introduced, 1989, laser. In 1990, radiofrequency. And 1994, microwaves, even though for some years, for many years, microwaves were not at the level of good clinical use as they are now. The main difference between chemical ablation and thermal ablation is uh, uh, summarized in this simple slide. Chemical ablation is always limited to the target, to the lesion, does not treat the surrounding tissue, while thermal ablations have the particular characteristic to be able to treat also a margin around the tumor. And this is the explanation of a movement from chemical to thermal. I had the luck in my life to start a collaboration many years ago at the beginning of the 90s, apart from the group of Tito, my friend Tito Livraghi, also from the group of Boston. Uh, Professor Goldberg was just uh, here in this location uh, some weeks ago giving his lecture, uh, Nahum is considered the father of the technology of radio frequency, and Professor Scott Gazelle, now in Boston, and the colleagues of the Mayo Clinic, uh, with all of them we started years ago. And we created our group, and uh, I have been working for, for many years uh, at the General Hospital of Busto, Assizio, where we uh, started. And uh, this is probably my main uh, collaboration, what we call the right arm in, in Italian. Uh, and she will also work with me here in this location in Amanitas. As you can see here, this was the trend in the, in the 90s, a progressive decrease of the use of ethanol for hepatocellular carcinomas and a dramatic increase of the use of radiofrequency in the same kind of disease. Nowadays, the scenario is much more complex because from radiofrequency ablation, which was the starting point, now we have many other kinds of uh, modalities, focused ultrasound, microwaves, laser, cryo, and more recently, irreversible electroporation. Apart from this one, which is a completely different system, all the others cause the same changes, in pathologic changes in the tissues when they are used. It means that the main, uh, co main effect is the coagulative necrosis. Then we have areas of apoptosis, creation of gas during the treatment, for sure, and granulation tissue all around, with the disruption of blood vessels, of course, of the entire lesion. Uh, for questions of uh, limiting time, I will mostly describe the results of radiofrequency, and then I will move to some new technology. Of course, uh, I have no possibility today to describe all the different uh, modalities. You see here that the scenario is particularly complex, because we have several imaging modalities we, we can use to guide the procedures, many kinds of ablative modalities, and many organs where we can apply the therapies. Uh, we started with liver, but now you see here there is a, a list of other possibilities. And this is the tremendous scenarios of all the different applicators that the different companies in the world in the last 20 years developed in the different kind of modalities, radio frequency, microwaves, and, and so on. The growth of uh, interventional procedures, of ablative procedures, was uh, really striking. In, in, uh, this is an example in Europe. 
from uh, the year to, uh, 2004, 2011, this is the increase. And you can note that the maximum increase was in the field of liver, but also the other fields of application are increasing day by day. Uh, I have not re more recent data, but uh, talking to the different companies, we can understand that the, every year there is at least a 15, 20% increase in the number of procedures in the world. In the same way, also the, the science moved. And uh, I am very glad and proud to have organized in collaboration with uh, Tito Nivraghi uh, in many years ago, the very first uh, meetings uh, in uh, inter image guided interventional procedures, especially for cancer therapies, starting from 1994. And at that time, two cities in Europe were the, considered the centers of that, Milan for our meetings and Copenhagen, much more than American locations or Asian locations. Uh, then subsequently also the American group started, and this is Jeff Gashwind, the organizer of the first important uh, non-Italian uh, meeting on that. But probably the crucial, the crucial moment for the history of this discipline was the meeting organized by myself and the other colleagues here in Italy in 2006 uh, in Chernobyl uh, with a large number of speakers and attendees. Why was this important? Because this meeting was the birth of the official term interventional oncology. Before that meeting, they, they were called image-guided therapies, image-guided therapies for oncologic diseases, but not the word interventional oncology. And why this uh, term was chosen? Because, uh, as you know, oncology started with some uh, definite fields, medical oncology, radiation oncology, and surgical oncology. So starting from 2006, we have the, the so-called fourth pillar of oncology, which is interventional oncology. Uh, of course, in par parallel, uh, we have an increase of publications in this field. You see here a, a slide um, which I had from the Mayo Clinic of France uh, some years ago, demonstrating the dramatic increase from 1995 to 2005 of publications under the world tumor ablation. If you now go on PubMed and check in the, other, in the last two years the number of publications, from approximately 600 in 2005, we have moved to more than 1,900 in 2013 and 2014. It means there is a continuous increase of scientific research and publication in this field. And I like to underline, to conclude this historical uh, uh, um, review, that Italy has always, always occupied a very important location, po position in this field. Uh, three years ago, the American Journal of Radiology published this paper from the Korean group. They did an incredible amount of uh, research trying to see in the last uh, 67 years of world radiology which were the first 100 top-cited articles published in the history of radiology, not interventional radiology, generally radiology. And if you see, in the group of these 100 papers, the most cited author is Dr. Livraghi, the second is myself, and we have other two, two other Italians, three other Italians in the same group. So uh, Italy in this particular field is important, and papers regarding interventional oncology and ablations have an important uh, role in the world of radiology. Clinical results. Uh, the rationale for ablation is very clear for any uh, kind of organ uh, uh, treatable. Many patients are not treatable with surgery for some reasons. Uh, ablation is repeatable even many times. It's a low risk therapy, we usually with high local efficacy, especially for small lesions. Size is crucial for this kind of therapies. L with a very limited loss of non-neoplastic tissue, and this is important particularly with organs, for organs in which you have already a dis an underlying disease, like cirrhosis for hepatocellular carcinomas, and dramatically low cost, much lower cost compared to other therapies. So uh, I cannot describe all the different applications, all the different fields. This is an example of a kidney carcinoma. And you know probably that nowadays, uh, kidney carcinomas below three centimeters are considered extremely well treatable with ablation, especially in uh, elderly uh, people. 
lung lesions are treatable. Both primary and metastatic lesions in the lung can be treated with ablation, again, uh, and size is crucial. Below three centimeters, uh, excellent results are going up, uh, worse results. Moving to smaller types of lesions, uh, lymph nodes. This is a, a therapy which uh, started exactly in my hospital uh, a few years ago. Uh, it means the treatment of recurring uh, neoplastic lymph nodes in the neck from papillary thyroid carcinomas after thyroidectomy and lymphadenectomy. These patients very often are young and they have to undergo many surgical operations during their life because of these new recurring lesions. And uh, the treatment with the laser in this field is extremely easy, extremely precise, and as you can see here, before treatment, after treatment, uh, these lymph nodes disappear in a few minutes after the treatment, requiring only local anesthesia and absolutely no hospital, uh, no hospitalization of patient. Another application, this is not a cancer. This is for a benign lesion, but, and you will see this probably in my opinion in the next years, the tremendous diffusion of this kind of treatment, the treatment of go uh, nodular goiters especially uh, young people who don't want to receive uh, a thyroidectomy. Or, on the other side, old people with some cardiac or pulmonary diseases, underlying diseases. Uh, the treatment is extremely simple. Again, does not require any hospitalization, does not require general anesthesia, and you may achieve both with radiofrequency and with laser sometimes. It's a dramatic reduction in size of the lesion three centimeters by two before starting the treatment, uh, several millimeters, uh, six months after the treatment. Another example of a mixed mass, thyroid mass, with cystic and solid portion, very large at the beginning, extremely small, 54 months after radiofrequency. Simple treatment, uh, uh, very precise, and complications are extremely, extremely rare. But liver is for sure the most important uh, target of these uh, treatments. And I will uh, just describe in, in more in-depth uh, results regarding liver. This is a paper, a Chinese paper. You know that China is becoming every day more and more active and important in this uh, field. Uh, they have huge amount of patients and they nowadays follow their patients much better than they did years ago. So their papers are becoming every day more significant. You see this paper regarding the treatment with radiofrequency of hepatocellular carcinomas in China, and you see that the one, three, five, and 10 year overall survival rates of these patients are extremely good. These are two other uh, uh, statistical data from Japan and from Italy. And as you can see, the survival curves are extremely similar and also extremely good. Uh, the treatment of hepatocellular carcinomas in cirrhotic patients uh, has, in, the, in the radiofrequency and ablation, an excellent modality. Uh, you see here that this is, these are lesions within two centimeters of size, while this paper in Italy, probably more important, includes also lesions within three centimeters of size. This is important. I will go back to this field in, in a moment. This is probably the most important, most significant clinical paper ever published regarding hepatocellular carcinomas. Why? This was a multi-center Italian study uh, coordinated by Tito Livraghi years ago, published in Hepatology uh, seven years ago, with hepatocellular carcinomas in the range of two centimeters. And the final, the, the final statement was that RGFC may have equivalent local disease control and survival of resective surgery but with lower invasiveness, costs, and complications rates. So for the first time, it was officially written that radiofrequency may be, or can be, the first line treatment in these patients. And TACE, or surgery, or, or ethanol injection, are only uh, reserved to patients at risk for radiofrequency, or as salvage therapy in the very few cases of RFA failure. This is important because just a few months after the publication of this paper, for the first time, the world ablation was officially inserted in a flowchart of therapy of hepatocellular carcinomas. 
This is the famous BCLC classification from the Barcelona group. Probably you know that probably the most famous liver center in the world is the Barcelona Center. And uh, for the first time after that paper, they officially introduced ablation in that position for very early stage HCCs, but also, if you, consider, if you see, also in this position here, lesions up to three centimeters when there are associated diseases which exclude other kinds of therapies. A, a very important field for HCC in these patients is the treatment of recurrent hepatocellular carcinomas. Uh, you know that due to the underlying disease, these patients tend to develop during the years many lesions in the liver. And if they are detected when they are very small, uh, local ablation is the, uh, an excellent treatment. In this paper, uh, Korean paper, recent Korean paper, uh, RFA is a safe and effective treatment modality for recurrent intrahepatic photocellular carcinoma with a five-year survival rate of 48%. And we agree perfectly. We have uh, uh, lots of cases uh, uh, we are, have been following for, for years and years and years. It, one, just one example, a patient uh, who was 68 years ago, uh, 68 years old when he started with us in 2003. First hepatocellular carcinomas 12 years ago. Other lesions in the same year. Uh, then I, I uh, skipped some other uh, images. Other lesions in 2009, treated. Other lesions in 2012, treated. And finally, an incredibly difficult lesion in 2014, in, in 2014, in the uh, dome of the liver. So, uh, 12 years of follow-up on patients. And every time with one or two more, two days of hospitalization and just a minimal anesthesia. Of course, uh, after some years, we tried to use also radiofrequency for larger lesions, for larger cancers. And uh, the results in some cases were excellent. In other cases were not excellent. Why? Because of the size. Because as demonstrated in this paper published uh, 10 years ago by the group of Muller in the Netherlands, you see that the uh, local control rate decreases significantly, increasing the size of lesions. So the size is absolutely crucial. The same is for, is, is for colorectal metastasis. Uh, you see here examples of lesions treated uh, and three follow up with excellent local control. But also for metastasis, you have the same problem. And this was initially uh, underlined by our paper published in 2001, the first paper in the world literature regarding the treatment of colorectal meth with a radiofrequency ablation. And if you see the, uh, the graph, you see clearly that for lesions below three centimeters, the local control rate was excellent. While for lesions larger than three centimeters, there is a dramatic decrease of the local control rate. And this was confirmed by many other papers in literature in, in the following years. Uh, I underlined this paper, again, in, from our group uh, three years ago, because this is the first paper in the literature with a 10-year follow-up of patients with colorectal meth treated with the local ablation. Again, you see that 10% of local control rate, uh, um, uh, sorry, 10% ten, ten of uh, local recurrence uh, for lesions below three centimeters, 45% for lesions over three centimeters. And this is well explained. Uh, you know that for surgeons, uh, the be best result is the so-called R0. The same is for ablation. A0 is what we consider the good result. It means that the lesion has to be surrounded, must be surrounded by a enough large safety halo of surrounding tissue in order to be locally cured. Otherwise, this will not be cured. And if you analyze the literature, the explanation is quite clear. Microsatellitosis is extremely frequent also in small, very small hepatocellular carcinomas. The microvascular perilesional invasion is very frequent also in very small hepatocellular carcinomas. The microscopic invasion uh, within one centimeter from the tumor edge is very frequent in colorectal meds below three centimeters, so what we call small metastasis. And uh, the summary of this is in this paper published uh, four years ago by the group of, of Wang in, in China, 
demonstrating then when the margin size is enough large, the local progression free survival rate is very high, while with very thin margin sizes, you have a very frequent local recurrence. For radio frequency, we have also this problem, the problem of the negative influence of blood flow. Uh, it means that the parts of the tumor which are adjacent to blood vessels, mostly venous vessels, are less treatable than the part of the tumor far from the vessels because of the heat sink effect of blood vessels. So what are the recent advancements after all this uh, uh, introduction? As you have clearly understood, we need larger abrasion volumes with thicker safety margins and energy sources which can minimize or even eliminate the heat sink effect. And this cannot be radio frequency for the reasons I have already presented. And currently, in our opinion, microwaves are the most important modality for that. Microwaves have many advantages. The current high power microwaves, not the first uh, of 20, 20 years ago, because they are hotter, they can achieve, uh, achieve 120, 140 degrees centigrade in tissues, which is not possible for radio frequency, not, not more than 90, 95 degrees. Uh, larger volume of necrosis in a much shorter time. Uh, you, you see here an example. Uh, this is a 2.2 centimeter hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, subcapsular hepatocellular carcinoma, studied in B mode, now studied with contrast ultrasound, extremely important in our opinion in this kind of treatments because this demonstrates clearly the lesion, the, the size of the lesion. This is the introduction of the antenna, and this time is 10:14 in the morning during the treatment, as you see here. Then you turn on the machine. And this is, this is the result, the inc very quick diffusion of uh, heating inside and gas inside the lesion. And if you wait a, for a minute, you see that five minutes after the introduction of the, of the antenna, okay, this is the time, the entire tumor is full of gas and gas goes also out of the borders. And contrast ultrasound shows clearly that there is a wide areas of necrosis created. So in five minutes from the introduction to the end, it means that if you are able to, to do this treatment under neuroleptone analgesia instead of uh, general anesthesia, you can start and finish the treatment in uh, 25, 30 minutes and it's done. In some cases, uh, the time needed for general anesthesia before and after is much longer than the time needed for the treatment itself. This is the lesion before treatment and this is the hepatocellular carcinoma after the treatment 24 hours later with no complications. Microwaves allow to achieve these results uh, extremely difficult for radio frequency. In 12 minutes with 60 watts, uh, a necrosis of more than five centimeters and very, very well rounded, which is another important problem to be extremely rounded. I told you that microwaves are much less sensible to heat sink effect than radio frequency. Demonstration in this case, lesion, lesion is here, entirely surrounded by large blood vessels, veins, of the, uh, hepatic veins, and you see that after the treatment, in only 12 minutes, you see the blood vessels entire, really still working, entirely surrounded by necrosis. So no damage of the vascular structures, but very wide volume of necrosis. And the same lesion, followed one year later, demonstrates an excellent local control with no sign of local progression. Impossible for radio frequency to achieve this result in that particular position. These are our personal data, still unpublished, uh, with microwaves uh, from the start of our experience in, uh, in 2010. You see that for lesions within two centimeters, the local control rate is extremely high, more than 95%. Between two and three centimeters, up to 86% and possible for RFA currently. For lesions even larger than three centimeters, 74.5%. It seems to be a relatively low percentage, but if you compare with most of the most data regarding RF, RFA, these are extremely, extremely better. And we have seen in our specific group, in our group, same group, the difference between the initial experience with radio frequency published in radiology 
where we had for colorectal meds a rate of local progression of 10% for lesions below 3 centimeters and 45% for lesions larger than 3 centimeters. In the same group, it means the same people, the same uh, indications for treatment and so on, using microwaves, we have moved to 6% for lesions be be below 3 centimeters and 18% for lesions larger than 3 centimeters, 45 versus 18, dramatic, and ch dramatic change. So this paper, recently published in the Annals of, uh, Annals of Surgical Oncology, uh, uh, states an important concept, validating the three centimeter breakpoint. If you remember the first slide, the previous slide, when I showed you the BCLC classification with the indication for ablation for HECs below two centimeters, within two centimeters, you can at least gain one centimeter. It seems nothing, but one centimeter in this particular field is a significant amount. So this is why more recent uh, flowcharts like this one of the Asian Pacific Society for the Study of the Liver, nowadays consider three centimeter as the indication, main indication for uh, ablation. And these results with microwaves are achievable without a significant increase of the complication rates. Uh, these are probably the three most important publications regarding the complication rates with microwaves published, also in large series, and you see that the the uh, percentages, 2.6, 2.9, 0.6, are in the range of most publications regarding radio frequency. So there is not a significant increase moving to a more uh, important, more active form of energy. Imaging. Uh, I told you that we need an, an important safety margin all around. It's not important, only important the thickness of the safety margin. It's important that the safety margin is well surrounding the entire lesion. If the safety margin is large in one part, but very thin, if not absent in another part, the probability that this portion of the tumor recurs and progresses is extremely high. So you have a second important need, uh, enough large safety margin and well symmetric around the lesion. This is why currently, and you will see this in the next few years, will be a sort of routine in our, in our departments of radiology. The definition of good treatment will not we provi be provided by single slices uh, in a CT or MRI, but with volumetric reconstructions demonstrating moving also in all the planes of the space that the safety margin is enough large all around the tumor. And this is, again, another, another example here uh, demonstrated in this particular field. Contest enhanced sonography. So we are also in the field of imaging. Uh, enhanced sonography has dramatically changed our, world, our uh, work in the last uh, 10 years because it allows to immediately understand if the lesion is enough treated or there are still remaining areas to be immediately retreated. So you, you do not have to wait for the follow-up study next day or in, at one month to see if the treatment is complete or not. This means that you can immediately retreat uh, saving sessions of treatment. A typical example in this field, large volume of necrosis of a previous treatment for hepatocellular carcinoma. CT shows clearly that there is a new recurring part of the tumor here, but B-mod sonography cannot define where it is. If you inject a few drops, uh, 1.2, 2.4 ml of uh, second generation ultrasound contrast agent, in a moment you will see where is the active part of the tumor, and in real time you can introduce your electrode or antenna and treat this part precisely, very comparable to the CT image. But the problem is that we have several imaging modalities nowadays, and you know very well, each of them, in the terms of guiding interventional procedures, have pros and cons. The pros of ultrasound are extremely easy to understand, and, but also the cons are easy to understand. Uh, many lesions are invisible or inaccessible to ultrasound. It's uh, highly operator dependent. Uh, sometimes you have a poor global visibility of the organ. From the other side, CT, 
PROS, extended field of view, independent from patient size, easy interpretation of the images. From the other side, the CONS, real-time use is dramatically restricted by the radiation exposure. Uh, the off-axis approach is often needed and it's impossible, uh, with, very difficult with CT, and lesions only, often are only transiently visible with contrast. Typical example, small hepatocellular carcinomas. FDG-PET, metabolic information is fantastic. The lesion conspicuity is excellent. Cons, difficult procedural environment, and you know very well, limited availability, and very high costs. So, in the, in the last years, several uh, studies have been done to try to overcome these limitations of the different imaging modalities. In uh, rich centers, uh, they have, have the luck to uh, buy machines, to buy technology every day. And you have, may have some nowadays guided, uh, robotics guided by CT or MRI, which can uh, perform the treatments under the, gui the distant guide of the operator. More simply, in the world, and I am again very proud to say that the very first clinical experiences started exactly in my previous hospital in Busto in uh, 14 years ago, you can fuse in real time sonography with any sectional imaging modality, CT, MRI, or PET. Using a tracking system, you create a, a small electromagnetic field all around the patient, and using a simple ultrasound machine in which the volume of the patient have, has been introduced uh, directly from the PACS system of the hospital, you can uh, put uh, sensors you can have a, supposed to be a transmitter here, box, and a sensor applied, for example, to the handle of the ultrasound probe. At this point, when this is done, uh, and you uh, start the system, you have the simultaneous visualization after finding some anatomical landmarks common to ultrasound and CT or MRI or PET. When you move your ultrasound probe, you move at the same time and simultaneously CT or MRI or PET. You understand that what cannot be found with ultrasound can be, find, can be found using the, 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 your uh, right eye here, looking at this image here. Secondly, if you apply also a sensor to the handle of the needle or the antenna you are going to use, you have the... Uh, uh, excellent visualization of the so-called, let me see, okay, of the virtual, virtual needle. This is the virtual needle which goes into the target on the CT image, but you are working on ultra, in the ultrasound room, not on the CT. But if the synchronization, if the, uh, the mm, registration has been well performed, it's the same. Uh, even if you miss the, tar the, 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 the lesion or the needle on ultrasound, you, your eyes are always here and you can always check the exact position during the treatment. This is the so-called virtual needle tracking. There are many uh, indications for the use of fusion imaging for ablations. Nowadays, uh, they are, uh, um, are diffused everywhere in the world. Uh, there are countries like uh, Asian countries where in most centers it is routinely employed. Uh, lesions best identified with other modalities different from ultrasound, lesions not at all seen with ultrasound, lesions only seen in the short arterial phase, like hepatocellular carcinomas, lesions hidden during treatment because of a gas, uh, lesions requiring multiple needle insertions, and so on. I have no time here to describe all the applications. Just let me present briefly two or three cases. Uh, I think that all of you with experience consider may consider extremely difficult to treat this lesion located here. It is entirely surrounded by the lung. If you, in this case, if you use CT guidance, you for sure you have to cross uh, many centimeters of lung parenchyma and pleura. It means that the pneumothorax is guaranteed after the procedure. Using this modality, you can start from below, from the caudal position going up and treat the lesion without any complication and without crossing the lung. A case of uh, a lesion, uh, a probably metastatic lesion, visible only with PET. 
uh, how can you guide the biopsy of this lesion uh, if you don't see the lesion with, uh, uh, with ultrasound? You fuse PET-CT with sonography uh, using the CT part of PET-CT for the co-registration and then switching to uh, the PET-CT where the lesion is clearly visible, invisible for ultrasound here. And this is the lesion before biopsy. This is the lesion during biopsy. In these cases, for, of course, the perpendicular approach is highly suggested because you are sure that when, when you localize the lesion, which you will see in a moment here on PET, this is the lesion, you are reaching the lesion going perpendicular without any risk of uh, movement of displacement of the needle during the procedure. This is the biopsy done. Cases also of ablation you can guide the same way. This is, as you can see, the local progression of an hepatocellular carcinoma treated some time before. Uh, simply sim seems to be simple to be treated. But if you observe this particular patient, the ultrasound image is extremely poor. It, it is even difficult to see the limits, the margins of the liver, not only the lesion. So how can you perform the treatment here? Impossible for ultrasound. In this case, again, you fuse and you use the virtual needle to check where you are going. This is the position needle. You don't see the lesion here. You see just the lesion here. And then when you are in, a cor in the correct position, you start the treatment. This, is, this was before, and this is after the treatment without any complication in a few minutes. Finally, uh, not, not a probably even more important case of a patient with a history of colon cancer, RFA for metastasis 10 months before, now progression, significant progression here uh, at the segment eight, and the dome of the liver, uh, se again, seems to be easy, but where is the lesion for ultrasound? Impossible, because the lung here, the shadow of lung covers completely the tumor. Uh, CT without contrast shows the position where the lesion should be. Contrast ultrasound cannot help because the lesion cannot be seen again for the shadow caused by the air in the lung. So again, in this case, the only possibility where surgery is unfeasible, when chemo did not give any significant response, is to use ablation. But how can you guide ablation in this particular field, in this particular case? In very lucky, few very lucky centers in the world, just to mention the Sloan Kettering Center in New York and uh, MMD Anderson in Houston, they have the interventional PET city room. Probably very difficult to think in our, uh, in our reality, in our uh, European world, because of the cost. So in this particular case, they use to introduce the needles under the guidance of PET city. We cannot do that. So our solution is to use a fusion of ultrasound and PET CT. This is the lesion you see here, impossible to see for, for ultrasound, impossible to see for contrast enhanced sonography, but only visible here. So just uh, trusting on the correct registration performed before, at this point, uh, you can introduce the microwave antenna where the lesion is visible on PET here and you start the treatment. Uh, almost invisible for ultrasound, clearly visible on PET. And the following day, if you repeat uh, PET, you see that there is an excellent local control from this situation to this situation after the treatment. So this image fusion modality, in my opinion, is very, very promising and important. We, have, uh, we had a long experience in our uh, previous hospital with this uh, particular uh, kind of technology, and you see that the lesions completely missed were in the range of 2%. And probably more importantly, this is the paper recently published in uh, CVIR, Cardiovascular Interventional Radiology Journal, where in 295 cases of lesions undetectable with ultrasound, we had a 95.7% uh, uh, rate of correct targeting, uh, for epithelial carcinomas, and 95.5% for metastasis. These two numbers, in my opinion, justify the use of this technology in this field. But you can adapt this technology also to other totally different situations. 
This is a young guy, very young guy, 17 years old, with a typical osteoid osteoma. But you see that the location of this tumor, very adjacent to the genitalia of the patient, is not so suitable. So guiding the treatment with CT in this particular location requires time and requires radiation to the patient. So what can you do? We tried to do this. We fused, in this way, uh, the CT image with ultrasound. And the lesion, the osteoidosteoma, is not visible for ultrasound because it's completely masked by the cortex of the bone. But as you can see, overlapping CT over ultrasound, you have a perfect co-registration. So you know now where is the lesion, even if you don't see in, real, in, in ultrasound, but you are only using sonography at this point. You have not yet used CT. Do you see the lesion? So when you are confident about the localization, only at that point you stick your uh, guide needle here and you move to CT only for the final control of the position just before starting the radiofrequency ablation of a patient. So in this case, we have adapted technology not thought for uh, bone applications uh, to a particular bone situation. We, I could show you many cases also in different parts of the body, but just limited my, my time here. So to conclude this part, uh, three concepts which in my opinion also for humanitas are very important. And I would like to uh, defend these three points also in front of the um, administration of this important center. In every center such important as humanitas is, many different technology for ablations must be available, not only one, at least two or three of them, depending from the type of lesion, the type of organ, the size of the lesion, and many other things. Secondly, the multidisciplinary approach is extremely important, especially for complicated cases. Third, least, last but not least, uh, the strict collaboration with the specialized anesthesiologist. I have never been able in my more than 20 years of ablations in a previous uh, hospital to have a specialized group of anesthesiologists using, uh, working with us. But this is crucial because if anesthesiologists are in strict col collaboration with the uh, person who performs ablations, they can decide case by case which is the minimal anesthesiologic approach to use and this limits the time and takes in very important advantages in terms of patient safety and costs also. Let me finish with some uh, combination therapies, very important. I like to show this case also for, probably for the young people in the room here because uh, in my opinion this is a case uh, uh, very important for uh, teaching uh, this kind of modality. Patient with two hepatocellular carcinomas, one of them is just adjacent to the gallbladder wall. I try to stop the image here. This is the use of contrast ultrasound through the arterial blood supply into the catheter introduced into the supplying artery. The amount of uh, uh, contrast here is 0.3 ml. It means probably four or five drops of contrast ultrasound, but directly in the tumor. And you see here that this is the pure arterial vascularity of the two lesions. If you wait a moment, you see that when the arterial supply disappears, you have two black images, totally black, and slowly the portal supply starts, and you will see in a moment also some increase of enhancement due to the portal supply of the lesion. So this is the demonstration of the real vascularity of hepatocellular carcinomas achieved with few drops of, uh, uh, of Sonoview, of contrast agent. You understand that this lesion here, adjacent to the gallbladder, was preferred to be treated first with chemobilization and eventually in second instance with uh, ablation. And this is what, what we did. This is after the first chemobilization, uh, partial disappearance of vascularity, but not complete. Some parts of the tumor are still visible. So repeated uh, chemobilization again better result, but again, not totally, not totally ablated with uh, chemobilization. So 
At a certain point, after two or three um, attempts, we decided to stop here and to move to, uh, to move to ablation, for sure. And you see in a moment, this is the moment when we decided to stop uh, the, uh, the phase of chemoembolization. And in a few hours, we put the patient on the ultrasound uh, table in the ultrasound room. This is the partial result of chemoembolization, as you can see here. So ultrasound room now, reinjection of uh, contas, you will see in a moment, and correct targeting of the active portion, still active portion, which is this one here, taking contrast. So you can introduce your antenna or your electrode directly in this part in real time in order to treat the remaining viable portion of the tumor. And this is what we did, very simply, in this case, not very close to the gallbladder, even if you can also go a uh, few millimeters far from the gallbladder without any significant uh, risk. And this is the, the result of the two wide volumes of necrosis of the two tumors demonstrated also. Um, and uh, we have just uh, followed this patient. Uh, uh, this was uh, two or three years ago. Uh, last week, we followed this patient in uh, uh, Humanitas here. And uh, the result of the treatment is still like this. So complete necrosis of both hepatocellular carcinomas. Uh, much more sophisticated, but uh, not yet feasible, probably in our departments, is the combination of radiofrequency or microwaves and liposomal doxorubicin. The injection of doxorubicin uh, in liposomes, in the uh, one, one single injection, as demonstrated by Professor Goldberg, who was here at the end of July, uh, creates a second effect. This is direct, the direct effect of the ablation. This is, three weeks later, the effect of doxorubicin on time. So the effect of the, the thermal ablation is immediate, the effect of the drug is much slower, but the combination is great. You can also use a combination of radiofrequency and sorafenib for the anti-angiogenic effect of sorafenib. This was also demonstrated in, uh, in animals so far. So, in 30 years, we moved from a simple syringe with some uh, uh, cc's of ethanol to, to where? To a, a great uh, present and probably even a better future. Uh, Nisbor said that prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. Uh, but we can predict something. First of all, again, going back to the excellent lecture of uh, Nahum Goldberg here at the end of July, we now know that the periphery of the ablation area is extremely important because from this periphery where partial necrosis and inflammation are present, uh, you may have sometimes this effect. Uh, it's in, in, in few cases, fortunately few cases, you may have an explosion after treatment of lesions elsewhere in the liver. Why? Because in some cases, there is a significant production of cytokines, and some of them have a very negative effect on liver from the area of treatment. So it should be very, very important for the next uh, periods of these uh, therapies uh, to study this patient, and this is why I proposed officially to Humanitas to start a study in this field. In my opinion, it's one of the most promising uh, studies to be done in this particular field of ablations, to simply uh, check the amount of uh, uh, interleukin-6 and 10 uh, after ablation and see what's going on. Because you can see that it is related to a complex process of tumor growth, and this can cause uh, both the local recurrence of the tumor and possible new lesions in a short time in other parts of the liver. This is not only for ablation. Also, TACE may have the same effect, chemobilization. And also, liver surgery may have the same effect. That's why we have also suggested to Professor Torzilli to start, if we start the study for ablations, we could also uh, join his group in the study to see if also for liver, surgeon, liver surgery, we may have in some cases a kind of a negative effect. Negative, which can, can be balanced by the use of drugs, which can defeat this production of these uh, uh, cytokines. And uh, this is more important, we have 
been studying that uh, you can use drugs of current use, mostly uh, anti uh, uh, pain drugs, uh, simply in current use. They, they may, they may uh, act against this production of these cytokines. So, in my opinion, this can be an important study. In the, in the field of imaging, the future, I don't know if you have ever seen this kind of images. This is a 2D navigation. You see here the cursor moving around the, the bone of this patient, and you have simultaneously the ultrasound image. It takes uh, two minutes for the co-registration, and you can go everywhere here. Uh, let's simply imagine how useful this can be even to teach young students anatomy. Uh, ultrasound anatomy sometimes is difficult. Uh, anatomy for bones on, on the X-ray is much easier, or anatomy on CT. Uh, using this uh, imaging modality, you can teach easily how to move your ultrasound probe, trying to find uh, muscles, bones, uh, and whatever. Another example of 2D navigation, this is a patient with a parathyroid located, pathological parathyroid glands located very deep in the neck, in the upper mediastinum. Uh, we were not able to find this gland with the sonography, even after more than 35 years of experience with ultrasound. So we, we took some uh, registration points, uh, these, the two, and then we started navigation, trying to reach this area here where the parathyroid is located. And you see that this is the parathyroid gland, and this is, down here, the parathyroid tumor, guided by the two modalities. Uh, going to the future, future, but not very, not very far. Probably, I'll, I don't know if I will have time in my career to see this in practice, but this is augmented reality. This is the use of particular glasses which can allow to see the internal part of the body pre-registered by CT, MRI, or PET, whatever, simply wearing glasses without any imaging modality at that time. Uh, this year, and probably some of you radiologists know that every year the most uh, important, the largest uh, radiological congress in the world is the Chicago Congress, the RSNA, the end of November. This year, at the large exhibition of Chicago, there will be a large part dedicated to the future of augmented reality in imaging. And this is what, and I have uh, personally suggested to Humanitas to start this experience uh, uh, with a startup, uh, um, an Italian startup. Finally, uh, next year, uh, following the experience I showed you of many years ago, uh, I will organize, uh, uh, together with Professor Goldberg and uh, Dr. Orsi, this meeting here in Milan, in the beginning of July, uh, the Professional Oncology Sun Frontier meeting, and uh, we decided to have the first day, the first world meeting on fusion imaging and augmented reality in interventional oncology. Interventional procedures which include also surgical procedures, endoscopic procedures, what everything is what is interventional. And I, of course, I invite you to be there next year. Thank you very much.